Okay, sales directors, are you ready for me? Because I am ready for you. What I'm going to train you on is coaching. Okay, coaching. I want to start with a little test to see what you actually know about coaching. So I'm going to read a sentence and you guys are going to fill in the blank. A teacher tells a coach, yes, ask questions or draws out answers. Teaching is one-sided, coaching is two-sided. When teaching, the teacher sets the agenda. When coaching, the student or the coachee or the consultant or the director sets the agenda. When teaching, the teacher knows all the answers. When coaching, the student knows all the answers. A teacher talks more than she listens. A coach listens more than she talks. You guys already know it. Let's go home. You know how to coach. Um, you already know the right answers. And I, I want you to know that the company is really focused on coaching over these last few years. It's kind of been a hot topic. It's, it's kind of a new hot thing, and even in the corporate world. And so I want you to know that you probably have a really good foundational understanding about what coaching is. Just based on your answers, you know the answers to that. But the question I want to ask you is, how effective are you as a coach? How effective are you? I heard some gasps and some sighs with that question. Because you coach so that performance changes. Okay, your coaching is to help performance change in your consultants. And so your effectiveness is really based on their performance. And now it's up to them. It's their goal. It's their baby. They make the decision. It's their success or failure but you have a lot of power as a coach. So on a scale of one to four, how effective are you as a coach? Be honest with yourself. How would you rate yourself as a coach right now? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the mindset of coaching, because I believe that's a lot of what coaching is, is understanding just what it is and how you should think about it. Then we're gonna to move to the mechanics of coaching. What do you actually say? What questions to ask? Coaching is the fastest growing human resource development process and is becoming an essential for every organization. So why is this? Why, why you ask? Because it produces real results. NSD Emeritus Barbara Sundin attributes her success in Mary Kay to one-on-one -on -one coaching coaching, which is how she developed leaders. That's how she did it. If you've ever heard her speak, she talks about that one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship so much. Another NSD emeritus, Ann Newberry, said, don't underestimate the power of one effective conversation. NSD Pam Shaw says, you can inspire a group, but you're going to move people one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so it's obvious that coaching is a core part of what we do as sales directors. And the last I heard, coaching has grown 20% in the corporate world because organizations are seeing such positive results with the one-on-one -on -one coaching process. They used to do those quarterly reviews where you would go in with your employer and they would rate you on certain things and they found that that's not effective. And so they're shifting from those reviews, quarterly reviews and year-end reviews to coaching their people, one-on-one -on -one coaching. So let's dig deep with the skills and the concepts of coaching so that you leave here not only knowing the right answers, like you already proved you know what coaching is, but I want you to leave here like feeling equipped to be a better coach. And I want you to start actually implementing some of the ideas we're gonna talk about. So I'm gonna go over 10 of my personal aha moments I have had on my journey growing as a coach. And a lot of these happened within our NIQ period. We don't have NIQ anymore, but it was kind of the window of time that our area was putting all the DIQs in place to wrap up. And a lot of these aha moments came from that core period where I really had to learn to dig deep and learn how to be a coach. So these are Leah Laughlin's rules of coaching, and they're 10 of my aha moments that I had. So number one, you cannot coach anyone unless they've given you permission to coach them. If they are uncoachable or they don't trust you, you never really engage in the coaching process. Now, you may give them advice and tell them what to do and tell them things and train them. We're really good at doing that as sales directors. We can talk all day about the right thing and the right script and what to do and train, 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 train. But you may not actually be engaging in the coaching process if they are uncoachable or they don't trust you. There's no relationship or rapport or trust that's been built. So you often have to earn the right to coach before the true coaching process begins. 
And I will say you do have more of a teaching role with new consultants. Their first two to six weeks, you really are in a way more of a teacher because you're just getting them set up. And you've got to just give them the tools and the resources and the tips and the information so that they're set up. Now, in those two to six weeks, that's usually the time frame that you're really kind of like giving them the resources as a new consultant. You work hard to develop rapport and trust with them. That's your window of opportunity where they really listen to anything you say because they're so new. You work really, really hard to build rapport and a relationship and trust with them so that after those two to six weeks, it evolves into a coaching relationship and the trust has been established. The way you earn the right to coach is to be an authentic leader. You cannot lead anyone until you lead yourself. You can't expect excellence, integrity, work ethic, and tenacity from anyone until you're modeling in your own business and life excellence, integrity, work ethic, and tenacity. You cannot help anyone discover their own personal excuses and discover their own weak links until you have been real with your own personal excuses and your own weak links. When we attempt to coach someone to a standard of excellence we have not held for ourselves first, people see right through that and there's no hiding it, and the trust is not strong. Okay, so it all starts with you. We always have to take a long, hard look in the mirror at ourselves first before we can expect to coach high performance in a consultant or a sales director. So look in the mirror, what do you see? Are you ready to be a more effective leader? Are you ready to be a more effective coach? Because it does absolutely start with you. Maybe what's wrong with your key people is you. <laughs> you know, we usually when we have a problem, it, it stems back to us and what's going on with us and our personal business and our life and our mindset and our thoughts. Okay, so it always starts there. That's why personal growth as a sales director always has to be such an intentional plan. We always have to be so intentional about growing personally and spiritually Otherwise, we are not really adequately equipped to lead our people. So four quick principles of being an authentic leader. The first one is, and this is all still under number one, you have to earn the right to coach and build a relationship with people. Number one, live out your values. That is something I, I really learned from Pam Shaw. I had to pick one thing that I learned from her when I was in her national area, is that before you can live your values, you have to know what they are. And I had never really spent a whole lot of time thinking about that until I got into Mary Kay and I was challenged with the question, what are your values and how are you going to live them out? Because often we think we have values, but there's no real evidence of them in our life. There's no real action or behavior that supports those values that we think we have. Okay, so live out your values. I read a quote recently by Ravi Zacharias, who's a Christian apologist, and he said, before anything can be lived, it has to be believed. You have to believe it first before you can live it out. And people are attracted to people who know their values and live their values. People want to follow people like that. Number two, in being an authentic leader, don't equivocate. And really what that means is let your yes be yes and let your no be no in everything that you do. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, period, in a story. Number three, take full accountability and responsibility for your personal life and for your business. And you have to be intentional about doing that. And then number four, if you say it, do it. Even in the small things. Actually, especially in the small things. Well, I think sometimes as sales directors we can say, oh, let's do this promotion, or you'll get this for doing this, or you'll earn this, and then we forget we said it. And then she gets really excited and she does it, and you forgot to give her the gift breaks down just a little bit of trust in, in their eyes for you. And so even in the small things, especially in the small things, if you say it, do it and follow through. A couple more tips to build trust with her. Know about her life. Know her kids' names. Know her husband's name. Know what her husband does for a living. Before you call her, check out her Facebook page. See what's going on. See what's important to her. Sometimes you don't really want to see what's on her Facebook page, but you can still, you know, kind of have a little clue of what's happening in her life. Remember her birthday. Remember her Mary Kay anniversary. Check in on things in her life that are completely unrelated to Mary Kay. Pray for her. Pray for her specifically. And value her beyond what she can do for you and your business. You know, sometimes we're excited about our key people just because we know they're going to help us with a goal. Like, yeah, I've got a DIQ. No, I don't have to worry about production because she's going to take care of it because she has to hit production. And so they cannot be a number on in touch. 
Okay, they cannot just be a number on InTouch and you can't just be excited about them because what they're gonna do for your business. She's a person with a soul and with dreams and someone who's been created in the image of God. She has intrinsic value and worth regardless of what she decides to do with Mary Kay and we cannot forget that, that truth about who people are and what their value really is. In the book Unleashed, it is a book on coaching. It's one of the best books I've read on how to be a coach. It's kind of like a handbook that I have gone back to, you know, like I've probably read it a handful of times and always go back and look at it. It's by Greg Thompson. He said that to be a good coach, we have to move from simply being a good leader to being the kind of person who others readily invite into conversations about some of the most important and often the most highly guarded spaces of their lives. Conversations about their talents, aspirations, and potential. And I'll read part of that again. He said we have to go beyond just being a good leader to be the kind of person that others readily invite into conversations about those, some of the most important and often highly guarded spaces of their lives, about their talents, their aspirations, and their potential. I really believe that being an authentic leader of integrity helps you to be that person that people readily invite you in. They trust you. They trust you and they're willing to invite you in to have those conversations. Okay, so number two, my second aha moment. I'm going to call this slow down to speed up. Okay, slow down to speed up. Here's how I used to do coaching calls and I thought I was a really good coach. <laughs> I had a list of who I wanted to call with their names and I had what I wanted to talk to them about and I'd pick up the phone and we would talk about those things and I'd be like, okay, great, hang up, call the next person. And you know, you just keep calling. And it was always about my agenda and what I felt like I wanted to talk about and I sort of rushed through the calls because I had a lot of people to call. And so what I learned is that's not actually really true coaching. I learned that sometimes I had to drop my agenda to meet people where they're at and guess what, those conversations take a whole lot longer. And it's a higher level of time and emotional energy that you invest into those conversations, but they're so much more effective and you build so much more trust. So sometimes you have to slow down on your agenda to speed up on the relationship and rapport that you're building with her. Another aspect of slowing down to speed up is just slowing the conversation down, even the feel of the conversation. Often my voice would even have like a sense of urgency in it and I think you have to take that sense of urgency and there's time to just have a quick conversation but when you're really engaging in like a one-on-one -on -one serious coaching conversation you just have to like slow it down and allow enough time for uh, coaching is like peeling back an onion you have to allow enough time for like the layers to be peeled back and sometimes your best response is hmm and it's just a hmm and it's a pause, and sometimes it's an awkward pause, but you have to allow for that slowness in the conversation, and sometimes that's the, the best response, and it's okay to have that awkward silence. But don't rush through these coaching conversations. Something I learned while in, in IQ is that the real coaching conversation sometimes and often doesn't start until you have the feeling that the conversation is over. So you know that feeling where it just feels like it's wrapping up and both of you can kind of sense that and you have to say some closing remarks and it's over. Well, I learned that that's the moment that it's probably really going to start to get good. It's going to start to get juicy at that point. And so when I used to wrap it up and end the conversation, now I know that that usually is where we're going to start to dig deep to the issues below the issues. It takes time to get to the issues. It takes even more time to get, the, get to the issues below the issues. And so when you feel like it's wrapping up, hold on just a little bit longer. Ask one more question to take it a little bit deeper. Okay, number three aha moment. You really have to release your desires, expectations, and hopes of how she can impact your goals. You really have to get to a point where you can honestly say, honestly, like in your heart, say that my unit and my people cannot disappoint me. They just can't disappoint me. Whether they beat you to national sales director or whether they return their product tomorrow, you have to work from a heart and soul that is not relying on them, counting on them, or your emotional wellness is not wrapped up in what they choose to do or not do because newsflash it's not about you and it's not about me it's about supporting people and being the best that they can be and living out their dream life and when you're personally working the numbers also with abundance you really don't need anyone I think sometimes that desperation and need for people comes from a lack of responsibility we're taking and working our own personal business and so there should be no desperation in your expectations so you completely release her to celebrate her success but 
but then her failure, it doesn't rock you from your vision and your goal and what you're working towards. And so I'll tell you just a quick story of probably the hardest loss I have experienced in losing a consultant. She had been with me for maybe two or three years at the point that she kind of backed down. She was at everything. She was at every unit meeting. She's a very visible person in our unit. She was um, very vocal. She was the life of the party, high eye. Everybody knew who she was. I knew her husband. I knew her four kids. I knew about her life. She knew about my life. I mean, there, she was just, she was an iconic person in our unit, okay? And so we're in the NIQ, our window. And you know you've got your list of 20, who you're counting on. She's at the top of the list. She's at the top of the list. And, you know, she kind of, it was a little bit of a roller coaster, I think, in and out of an, uh, DIQ, kind of up and down with her business. And then just a couple of things happened, and I don't even remember what they were, but I could just sense, you know, something was off. And so we had a live conversation, and I knew it was coming. And I remember the moment I was driving, driving down the highway, 75, going to Cincinnati, and she said the word, she said, I'm out, I'm out. And this is an NIQ. She's one of the 20 about to go into DIQ and an iconic leader in our unit. And she says, I'm out. And I'm pretty emotionally strong and stable, but tears welled up in my eyes and have never experienced like the, ooh, the sting of that loss, like I had when she said that. I mourned her, but also just had a spirit that could completely release her. No bitterness, no resentment, and it did not change, of course, my, my focus on the goal. So it's okay to mourn people, but there's a difference between like holding on too tightly to what they decide to do. Because you're going to have people who call you and they're going to say, I'm out. And it's going to be in the uh, most intense moments of your business and people are going to walk away. And you have to be okay with that. Your goals and your dream and God's plan for you is bigger than anybody who comes into your business or decides to walk away. So I lived through it and you will too. So number four aha moment. John Maxwell says that people will rise to the conversation that you have about them. And as a sales director, you should always be very, very intentional about talking about who you are as a unit. This is who we are. This is how we roll. This is what we do. This is how we present ourselves. This is the standard of excellence that we hold ourselves to. That should always be a conversation that's happening about your unit. And often, your unit's not looking like that. <laughs> you're saying these things about, this is who we are, and then you look at them and you're like, well, it's not really, we're not quite there yet. <laughs> but you're still saying it because you're, your words have power. Your words have power, so you speak that into their lives, and guess what? They raise to that standard because you're expecting it. You're expecting it. So people will rise to the conversation that you have about them. I've heard um, Inner Circle National Sales Director Stacey James say that women, women will become what the most significant mentor in their lives believes they can be. In the book Unleashed, the author said people will live up or down to the expectations you have for them. He goes on to say that we can sense how others feel towards us. Given a little bit of time, we can always tell when we're being coped with or manipulated even if it's beneath a veneer of niceness. And I think we're good at the veneer of niceness in Mary Kay, which is a great thing. We live in a happy, positive pink bubble, and we should. But sometimes we're a little too good at that veneer of niceness, and we forget that there should be authenticity and sincerity behind what we say and how we treat people. And usually people can sense that, and they typically resent it. And so your assessment of your people matters, and people do know what you think of them. Pam Shaw says that people know when they're being tolerated or celebrated. Consultants will stay with you forever, you guys, when they feel good when they're in your space. They may not ever do anything with Mary Kay, but they'll be with you forever and still show up at events and still support the unit when it's time to rally if they just feel good when they're around you. Okay, so that relationship aspect of our business is so, so vital. Now, you're going to have consultants who you naturally love and enjoy being around, and you're going to have people who you just don't mesh with. And that's normal, and that's, that's okay. But we have to learn to see all people the way God sees them, to see them as children of God. And I pray every day that God would give me His eyes for my people. His eyes for my people. I would actually see them through His eyes so that I can have great expectations for everyone, not just people I naturally like and naturally get along with. And great expectations for her, not because of how she can help me reach my goals, because of who she is and because of her intrinsic value and worth. We coach our people in order to help them unleash the best version of themselves. 
So we have to see them in that best version before we can coach them to that best version of themselves. And just kind of a side note on this, in, in IQs, another big thing that I learned is that our key people will not always fit into a pretty little box that we feel like they should or want them to. I once had this DIQ who was a bit of a rebel. She liked to do things her own way. She bucked the system way outside of the box. I would often leave my meeting and all I could think about was how she annoyed me the entire meeting. <laughs> But I was slow to address it. I was slow to address these little things. And it wasn't any, no like integrity issues. It's just like little things that she didn't fit into like what I thought she should. And so I was slow to address it because I hadn't built a relationship of trust. You know, you know when you've built trust with people and when you haven't. And I knew that I hadn't and she had a little bit of a wall up. And sometimes we're too quick to like whip people into Mary Kay shape and then we break their trust. Okay, so we got to be careful to do that. You can't crack the whip too hard, especially with your new people and especially if you don't have trust established. And sometimes we just got to give people our grace, especially in the beginning. So as I built the re a relationship with this rebel DIQ, I found out more about her background. And she came from a very broken home with dysfunctional relationships and her mother had betrayed her trust. And so she didn't trust women, especially women in a position of authority. And so she brought all of that to the table. Okay, she brought that to the table and everybody brings their own individual story to the table. And so it's a part of our job to find out her story and build trust with her before we can effectively lead, coach, or mentor her. Had I not been patient with this Rebel DIQ, had I tried to whip her into Mary Kay shape, I know she would have walked away. I didn't try to coach her too much until I knew she had let her wall down and she had let me in. And so I'm not saying lower your standards, that's not what I'm saying, but to see people through God's eyes and give them grace and have great expectations for everyone. I read a quote recently that says, be kind, everyone is fighting a hard battle. Isn't that true? Be kind. Everyone is fighting a hard battle. You don't know what people bring to the table. You don't know what's going on in their head and their heart. Everyone's got their stuff. I don't care what they look like on the outside. Everyone's got their stuff that they're working through. Okay, number five, aha moment. You don't always have to have the answer. That's exactly what you should not do when coaching. I thought I had to be Mary Kay answer lady on coaching calls. And I just like hated that. It was just, ugh. I'm like, oh, I don't want to tell one more person how to do a booking, you know, how to go through a booking script or how to pre-profile. But when I realized I didn't have to feed them the right answer or solve her problems, it freed me up to start experiencing joy in the coaching process. Before I really learned how to coach, it wasn't a joyful experience. It was more just like a, oh, I gotta do this. But when I let go of like having to feed them the right answers and solve their problems, I'm like, oh, this is actually really fun to dig deep and help her discover her answers. I think sometimes as directors, we go into micromanaging mode. We just like start to micromanage their life and plan their life and plan their day and get out your weekly plan sheet and show me your days that you have available. And we, tr we try to solve all her problems for her. And she's a big girl and we've got to treat women like they are adults. And what you really don't want is to build a unit in the area of people who need you. You really don't want that. When you try to micromanage all these pieces, she thinks she needs you. And it becomes this weird codependent relationship. You gotta stop trying to do that for your people. I realized all I had to do was ask her questions to support her in discovering her own answers. For example, let's say she's having trouble booking career surveys. You would ask something like, well, hey, is there something you think you might need to tweak in your script to get different results? Okay, you don't have to give her another script. You don't have to walk through it with her. Just say, hey, is there something you feel like you should change in what you're saying or how you're saying it that would help you get different results? And then she starts processing through like, okay, yeah, what am I saying? that I might need to change or how am I saying it that I might need to change in that. So in addition to not needing the right answer, we need to also give our people freedom to be right. I heard Sean Key say once, quit making your consultants wrong all the time. I think that's such a powerful statement because we're always trying to correct them. And yes, there's a time and a place for advice and guidance, absolutely. But let her have an idea, let her go try it, realize it doesn't work and come back to you and create a new plan. She's gonna take more ownership of her business and again, she's not gonna feel like she needs you. And then you're gonna get less phone calls and you're not gonna have your phone buzzing all the time because you're teaching people to problem solve themselves. And it allows you to experience more joy in the journey and you actually create a stronger unit and a stronger future national area because they can handle it themselves. The way you're developing people who are building independence, not people who need your answers and need your ideas all the time. Um, Galileo said, you cannot teach a person anything. 
you can only help them discover it within themselves. That's like kind of a core concept for coaching. You can't really teach people anything. You're just helping them discover the answers within themselves. And you do that by asking questions and letting them be right about their own ideas. Okay, number six. Coaching is not motivating people. I always get the question, how do I motivate my people? What's the answer? You don't, so you know that. You know that you don't motivate your people. All you can do is lead by example and, and, and attract people to you because of your passion, your authenticity, and your love for them. You will never really motivate anybody. And no promotion or no bangle bracelet is gonna talk somebody into living their best dream life. Yes, there's a place for promotions in our business, but we're trying to like use these like grand promotions and ideas and you're key ready right now, people, they're gonna do it whether you dangle a bangle in front of them or not. Okay, so let's remember that. Number seven, coaching is not counseling. There's a fine line. Coaching is not counseling. Yes, you dig deep with your people, but you don't have them pull out all their dirty laundry to have a therapy session with you. And so you just don't go there. Okay, and you do cut the conversation off. You don't wanna hear about all the things her husband does and and all the stuff and just do remember never try to play therapist or counselor role that's not your role number eight coaching is an IPA coaching is an income producing activity it should be a part of your weekly and daily schedule weekly and daily it should be something you're consistently doing in your business now you may not have a unit that has ready right now people to coach and so don't hear me say that you should just like stalk them and try to talk them into being a ready right now kind of person. If you don't have ready right now people to coach, that just gives you more time to go out and find them. Okay, so let's not get confused. Don't go home and like stalk your entire unit to try to coach them. Go find them. But if you do have people to coach, it is an income producing activity. Cadillac sales director Sarah Light, who's in our area, I don't know if she's in this room right now, uh, she did a really good coaching session. She trained on coaching at leadership on our director day. She's one of our top five directors and what she said is that's so true about coaching is what's most important doesn't scream the loudest. What's most important doesn't often scream the loudest. And I think that's what coaching is, like real coaching. I'm not saying boxer. Guys, boxer is not coaching as much as like we think it is. And yes, it's good for feedback and going back and forth. But when I say coaching, I'm talking about a live one-on-one -on -one conversation. It doesn't scream really loud because we have other ways to communicate. And so do be intentional about coaching your people. And this is for those of you who have offspring sales directors. When I was on the trip in China, I got this really good advice from Barbara Sundin through Diane Mentaplee. Okay, Barbara Sundin was Diane Mentaplee's adopted national sales director. And we were just standing out by the bus one day in Beijing, and she had just been with Barbara, and I'm like, okay, tell me what you learned. And Barbara's so big on one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I forget what she said or how I had the, the like aha moment. We're talking about our key people who are really independent and some offspring sales directors who are just like superstars. And I'm like, yeah, well, I don't really need to coach them because they know what they're doing. And Diane, is like, Diane said, no, 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 those are, those are exactly the people you need to be coaching because they're the ones that are going to take the advice and run far and fast with it. Yes, they may be super independent and that's great, but those are the people you really dig deep with and coach because they're going to take that information and immediately apply it. And so you don't, when you make your coaching list, especially with like DIQs and offspring sales directors, our tendency is to want to go help the ones who need help first. But what you should be doing is reaching up to your superstars and saying, hey, what's your strategy? Let's make a plan. What big things are you gonna do this month? Okay, so that was a big shift for me. Number nine, you have to be fully engaged and completely undistracted when you coach. No phone, no computer, and ideally no driving, unless you really know where you're going. I've done a lot of coaching calls driving down 75 South to Cincinnati, and so I could do that in my sleep. But ideally, you just wanna be sitting and completely undistracted. I actually have a separate chair in my office that's right in front of a window, and my computer and my desk are behind it, and I just sit there and stare out the window. That is the only way you can really engage. If you're sitting in front of your computer, and I use a, I use a headset when I coach so I can actually see my phone, and so you can see everything that's coming in. I have to turn it face down so I don't see like texts and boxes coming in. So you do have to be completely undistracted. And number 10, don't let your personality style get in the way. Let's be honest, eyes annoy D's. <laughs> C's annoy eyes. 
D's freak S's out. <laughs> our personality style can be an asset to our coaching or can be a liability. You can't use your personality style as an excuse or hindrance. D's, you might have to lower your D. And it's, you can't use the excuse like, I'm just a D, so I'm just going to be direct with her. You can't play that card. If you're talking to an S, you need to lower that D and speak, speak her language. I's, you have to realize that C's need the details even if you could care less about the details. They need the details to feel safe and happy and like everything's okay. S's, you have to realize that some people, your people, could move a lot faster than you did. And that's okay. Sometimes S's hold people back like, oh, that's too fast. Like, slow down, you're making me nervous. <laughs> Let her run, okay? Let her run. Just because you don't move that fast doesn't mean that she can't, okay? And I believe S's can move fast too. So don't let your don't, sometimes we just say, oh, I'm an S, oh, I'm an I. And we use that as just like our excuse not to relate to people. It's a people business. Don't let your personality get in the way. It's not a good excuse. C's, sometimes you need to not bog down your consultants with so much information. Just because you need the information doesn't mean that they do. And so don't bog them down with too much training. Sometimes less is more. So let's shift gears and I'm going to talk about dangerous conversations or tough conversations which are real coaching conversations. And I'm going to give you a couple tips and we're going to talk about what they are and then you're going to have a few minutes to practice them. Okay, a dangerous conversation is when you're helping to unveil her blind spots. We all have blind spots. We all have blind spots. We don't see them because they're blind spots for us. We don't see our own personal blind spots. It takes a coach to come in there and peel back the layers for us to see our blind spots. So we all have them and that's really what the coaching process is about. Another phrase that Sarah used in her coaching was to dig deep to the issues below the issues. There's always issues and then there's the issues below the issues. And so in these dangerous conversations, you're digging deep to the issues below the issues. Guys, coaching is an art, not a science. It's an art, not a science. It's based on intuition. I cannot give you a perfect formula. And I'm really not going to try to feed you all these great questions. Okay, that's usually what everybody wants. What questions do I ask? And you want to write them all down. And I think that distracts you from just being present in the moment with that person in the conversation and just asking things that apply to what you're talking about. You don't need a perfect formula. You don't need a perfect set of questions. All the C's in the room are like, Ah, give me the formula. Just tell me exactly what to do. And so I'm not going to do that because that's not what coaching is. The author in Unleash said, coaching is not a nice, neat cognitive process involving the exchange of feedback, insights, and action plans. That's how I used to coach. It was this nice, neat conversation where I had an agenda and we talked about goals and action plans and feedback and that was it. And it was this nice, neat little package. But he goes on to say that coaching might be better described as a muddled, awkward expedition full of chaos, experimentation, self-learning, and disappointment. It's about building intense, development-focused relationships and engaging in risky, performance-changing conversations. Coaching is a way of being, not a scientific formula you follow. And you don't have to have the perfect question when you coach. Just ask her something. Just ask something. And if it's wrong and if it doesn't really like hit on a, a sweet spot or a hot spot, ask her another question. Okay, it doesn't always have to be right. I think we hold ourselves back because we're worried we don't have all the right words or all the right questions. Just go for it. It might be awkward, it might be messy. That's okay, that's the coaching process. I'm gonna walk through three situations and I'm gonna give you just like a really rough agenda of what you're gonna say in these three situations. Here are the th three situations and I tried to think of like what comes up a lot. So number, situation number one, a frustrated consultant. Frustrated, she can't get any bookings, everything's canceling. She's at the point of frustration, nothing's working. She thinks she's doing the activity and the work. She may or may not be, but just frustrated. Everything's canceling. That's the situation. Situation number two. Somebody's talking the talk, but not walking the walk. I'm going to be a sales director. She's never held a party. So, so, you know, you've all had those people talking the talk, not walking the walk. What do you say? What do you say to her? How do you coach her to, for her to perform to what she's saying she wants to do? Number three, um, making all kinds of excuses. Everything's an excuse. I was going to come to the meeting tonight, but my kid got sick. I was going to do this, but this happened. I was going to, I was going to, I was going to, I was going to, but da 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 It's an excuse for everything. It, you notice that excuses are a pattern and a habit for her. What do you do? What do you say? 
How do you have an engaging coaching conversation to help her move forward from that place? So those are the three situations. Let me just give you a, a rough outline. And again, I don't want to give you a perfect formula because then I would not be being a coach for you. I'd be a teacher for you, telling you this is what you should say. So I just want to give you a rough little outline to follow and then let your coaching develop out of that outline. And I would ask just like several questions, like a handful of questions. And then after you ask questions and you feel like you've dug a little bit deep to maybe un uncover something, then maybe offer a little bit of advice. Just a little bit. Just a little bit of advice that supports her ideas that she's had. Okay, so she's given you answers, she's had ideas and thoughts. A little bit of advice that is connected to her ideas and then finish the conversation with an action plan that she can go do that makes her feel like a winner. Okay, questions, questions, questions. A little bit of advice based on her answers leave with an action plan. That's the rough agenda I want you to follow. I want to finish the class with an action plan for you guys to go from here and really engage in coaching with your consultants who are actually here. This is what I do after every single event. I've done this for years. I do the same thing after every event. As I'm leaving, so either tonight or tomorrow, I'm texting consultants and directors, setting up a specific time. So already in my schedule on Monday and Tuesday are blocks of time scheduled for coaching. Okay, so I already have that in my schedule. So when you're planning your week for next week, you've got to schedule time to coach your consultants and your sales directors. And so I set up a specific time, and here is an outline. I'm going to give you a rough outline again because I want it to be free-flowing, and I don't want you to follow a specific formula, but I do want to equip you with at least something to go off of. Here's what I would do. We get on the phone. I say, okay, I want to talk about all kinds of things. I want to talk about your goals, your dreams, your aspirations, what you learned, what your plan is. But I'll let you start. Like what stuck out to you the most or what was most impactful? Okay, so you leave it broad, wide, and general. And just let her just tell you and talk to you about what's on her heart, her mind, what stuck out to her. You don't give her any real specifics. You start, tell me what's on your heart, what was most impactful. And then you'll probably want to ask a couple follow-up questions after that. You're going to have people who just told you what they learned. Well, I learned this really great booking script and I learned it's a really great way to close the roll-up bag. With people like that, you might want to ask a follow-up question. Well, like, tell me how you felt. What was most inspiring? Then you're going to have people who say, I felt like this, and I was crying the whole time. And, you know, they're going to be more emotionally driven. And so then you're going to say, well, tell me what you learned. Tell me what you learned. <laughs> and so you're going to have both people, and you kind of want to hear both. You want to hear the head and the heart of what she experienced at the event. And once you just kind of, like, process through that stuff, and a question I would ask to kind of shift to the next part of the conversation is I would ask, what goal are you most excited about between now and seminar? You give her a deadline. You might even just say April. What goal are you most excited about in April? You don't want to hear about when she wants to be a director in 2019. Because <laughs> sometimes they go there, I want to be a red jacket two years from now. It's like, okay. And so you give her a time frame. What are you most excited about in April? What's your goal in April? Or what's your goal between now and seminar? And then she tells you. And then you say, do you feel like you have a good strategy or plan? Our temptation is to, to give them the strategy. Here's a strategy. Here's a plan. But if you ask, do you feel like you've got a good strategy? She probably doesn't. But just by asking if she does, brings her wall down to realize that if she doesn't, she's ready to receive it from you versus you just giving it to her. So you see, you're gonna give her the strategy anyways, and it's okay to do that, but you started with a question. Do you see how that shifts her, kind of shifts her mind and she's ready to receive it by asking the question first? And then you create a customized plan for her. And so something our area does in the beginning of the month, so by April 5th, we do book 10 by the 5th. And so that's a goal every sales director and every consultant works on. But you can't just say, okay, go book 10 by the 5th because she may be a consultant who's never made a booking call in her life and she's scared to death to pick up the phone. So you gotta say like, okay, how about this? Like, what do you think about making five calls tonight? And then we reconnect about how those five calls went and we get another action plan together. Okay, little win, just a small little win. Because she's scared, and if you say go book 10, she's gonna shut down. Okay, so you give her a small little win, reconnect, another small little win. But then you have rock stars who their book 10 is already done. They've got guest lists for all the parties. You give them a bigger goal that's customized for them. Okay, you can't just tell everybody go book 10. You leave with her action plan 
and a way that you're going to follow up, however you want to follow up, Vox or text, another live conversation, but tight follow up, I would say within 24 to 48 hours. And so I'm going to walk through that same, that same process with the people who are here. And that's a great way to be in their space right away so that they're moving forward in the month of April while first finishing March strong and then moving forward in April with a great plan and a strategy. So, all right, ladies, our time is up. Thank you so much.